So, uh, podcast Innovating Humanity, how to look from different and new angles uh, to the ways how we can improve our society. And uh, let's say that we are um, all together in this uh, in this crisis. So, and so many crises we have right now. And so, I have today wonderful, wonderful guest, uh, Mr. President uh, Henrik Thomas Ilves, um, former president of Estonia and uh, inspirational figure, uh, I suppose, from uh, for a lot of lot of people. Yes, <laughs> yes, Mr. Uh, I suppose you are humble enough uh, to be kind of uh, reject all those uh, I don't know um, um, celebrations on that stuff, but you are really inspiration uh, in a lot of stuff. I asked yesterday for some of my colleagues what they would like me to ask you, and there were a lot of lot of suggestions what to ask you and uh, how to, to talk about. So nice to see you, Mr. Elvis. Sveiki. <laughs> Sveiki. Uh, you speak in how many languages? Five languages. Well, to different degrees, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's let's dive stri- uh, str- uh, straight uh, into this uh, topic of crisis. And uh, as you are uh, and you have uh, two degrees uh, in psychology, right? Uh, so, uh, what I am most interested in is uh, topic of mindsets. So we have these crises right now. Yeah, I should say, just so you know, I my degree is in experimental psychology. I know nothing at all zero about any kind of anything higher up i mean i my degrees uh, degrees are i mean what i did were experiments in perception and cognition it's basically how you see things so not i mean it's a it grew out of a philosophical interest i thought of uh I mean, it seemed like it was an it was a way to find empirical, scientific answers to philosophical questions on how we know things. But basically, and when it gets any more sort of higher level, I don't know anything about that. I mean, <laughs> aside from what everyone else has read. Uh, this is kind of really good sign about self-confident man who says that I don't know uh, a lot. You know, Socrates uh, had this saying that uh, the more I know, uh, the less I know, right? Okay. So, anyways, uh, let's pretend that we can uh, at least uh, the, to think about, right? Uh, think about that out loud. So, the question right now for me is the basic. Maybe let's 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 try to uh, determine uh, where we are uh, from your standpoint. Uh, do you think and uh, about uh, the situation right now? And is this crisis and what kind of crisis are we in in terms of climate change, in terms of energetics, uh, in terms of Ukraine and Russia and all that stuff? What is the situation we are? now and from that on we could just kind of uh, dive deeper into that well in many ways i would say that they're all they have a common thread which is um not becoming after i mean if basically 80 in 80 years after world war ii we have um become so comfortable with solutions and uh, that uh, we haven't really thought about new challenges. Uh, so much of our time was spent overcoming problems that were caused by World War II. In the West, it was uh, after 1945, in our case, after 1991. So we have been so busy trying to undo the damage of World War II. Um and what we've seen happen is that, first of all, we haven't, um, we forgot about, uh, forgot about uh, the things we did to prevent more war. So most importantly, I mean, we see uh, what's going on in Ukraine, but al- already beginning in 2008 with Georgia was that, you know, we have this basic rule that if we want to come out, if we're not going to avoid war, we cannot allow aggression changing borders through use of force and so the west did nothing after 2008 in georgia did nothing after 2014 and even today we find western leaders saying oh well maybe we should give putin something so to stop the war which is completely a violation of the u.n charter of the CS, CSE Helsinki Final Act, the, the Paris Charter, all these things. That's one example. Um, climate change, uh, I think, again, we became so used to, so used to 
saying, well, you know, it's a problem, but, you know, if someone else will deal with it, uh, I'm, you know, my at my age, uh, I don't want to deal with it, let someone else, it's too expensive. So you push these crises on into the future. Um, in the case of, you know, the, the Rus Russian aggression, we don't want to deal with it. We'd might rather find a comfortable solution right for now. As far as climate change, well, we can do something, but let's not really do too much because it, we might not get reelected. So, I mean, it's this comfort. We've become comfortable uh, with the way things are. And certainly, uh, the at least in our part of the world, uh, I would say, which I mean by Central and Eastern Europe, there is some kind of memory of actually taking radical action to do to solve issues. If you go west, it's it's too, there's too much comfort and too long a time being comfortable. And if you go east, well, they're not doing anything. So <laughs> we're the ones who are, have some kind of memory of what it is. And I don't mean just the Baltic countries, but you know, Poland, Czech Czech Republic, Slovakia. Um, well, I'll leave, skip over Hungary, but anyway, I mean, there is at least this uh, sense that we need to do something to get. To solve our problems, um, whereas um, in uh, I would say in a place like Germany, it's like well, let's try to keep things as comfortable as possible and not rock the boat. We saw that actually in the case of Germany already when we were striving for our independence was like, no, oh, no, let's not really, let's, you know, I mean those bolts, those, uh, no, it's not really. Better that they stay in the Soviet Union. It was kind of the attitude, certainly uh, with people like Helmut Kohl. Mm -hmm. So uh, conformity—that uh, that's the name that uh, comes here, right? And uh, the question is, what do you think? Uh, what plays a role to change that? Because uh, I don't see any kind of impulse to change it in terms of media, in terms of education. What can change it? Um, so, for example, the question about critical thinking. Right, uh, one of the basics uh, how we analyze information. What what would you say that uh, what approach we need to change in, in this term? Well, I think in some sense we also have become too comfortable. I mean, if I look back at the radical changes that were under that we undertook in my country in the 1990s, these days it's much more difficult to get anything radical done. Um, and it's only really in certain fields where you see a willingness to uh, try something new and different um, and not all areas. I mean, it's hard to be kind of a Trotskyite and live in permanent revolution, but but I mean, what? It, but it was a rapid radical reform that in fact got us out of the mess that we were in. Uh, whereas uh, the un lack of uh, will and uh, well, lack of willingness on the part of most of the post-commie countries uh, meant that they were perfectly happy to continue doing things the way they were, except that you instead you had the benefit of having your own little country and you just made the party first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and you're making your local party secretary president of the republic, which we saw, I mean, basically in most of the Soviet Union, or, I mean, sort of when it broke up, whereas at least we had some kind of idea uh, that we didn't want to go continue that route. So we, that was already a radical step. Um, but the uh, lack of will on the part of the other 12 led to stagnation and even, I mean, the corruption and the mess that they're in. So, I mean, look at, I mean, let's face it, we all started out in a level playing field in 1991. The difference between Moldova's GDP per capita in rubles and Estonia's was really not very big. I mean, in fact, it was almost non-existent. So, but Moldova didn't do anything, and we did. And same thing is true of Georgia until uh, Shakashvili. They didn't do anything. Ukraine didn't do anything really until 2004, and then, and that did, even that didn't last. And then they had to do it again in 2014. But there was this comfort or unwillingness to actually undertake radical, radical steps to uh, change the situation that they were in. 
But as I said, we too are getting comfortable because now it's been uh, 31 years of living in uh, in democracy and 31 years of what was before we were poor. Now we're rich. Now we don't really, want, I mean, we're not really rich, but I mean, compared to where we are, I mean, we're, uh, compared to where they are to this day, I mean, we're actually doing extremely well. So um uh, I'm not really that, um, and, and so we have become comfortable with the way things are. Life is not bad. I mean, it's really the only the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine that has brought us back to reality, saying, "Well, you know, things are not good, and we have to do something." So you see things such as spending much more on. Uh, on defense and uh, sort of serious attention paid to security issues that we did not pay attention to. The energy crisis, of course, is something we have been warning about for ages. I mean, the Baltic countries have been doing this all along, saying that the dependence uh, on Russian gas um, is politically dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous for our security. We were laughed at and said, ha, 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 you know, we just, this is strictly commercial. Well, it wasn't strictly commercial. Um, so, I mean, that crisis, I think, was foreseeable. Uh, and we, in fact, were among those that actually talked about it. I just, I just tweeted a picture about uh, right before this podcast of, um, Estonia's entry into the Venice ac architecture mm -hmm. biennale, in which the Estonian contribution in 2008 was a yellow pipeline between the Russian and the and the German uh, pavilions. I mean, I thought it was very clever when we did it, but you know, now it really is just exactly what uh, I mean. What the problem is, so. Excuse me, I keep getting these things here. So, in any case, so what other crises are there? I mean, those are pretty big. Ukraine war, big. yeah, sure, sure, sure climate, sure. energy. You know, uh, here from my perspective, what I understand that uh, always this topic uh, is about uh, human irrationality. So, how we perceive things. And we kind of, uh, the, the danger is that we think that we are rational people, but mostly kind of conformity can kind of change our attitudes just in a bit, I don't know, in five, ten years, it's, it happens really quickly. So the, again, I will just return my, my question towards uh, education. Do you think that maybe there are some solutions uh, in terms of education that uh, this is kind of really strange that critical thinking or emotional intelligence or all, all that stuff, it is not included in educational system? What's your take on that? Well, it's hard to say. With I mean, without really, without turning into a cranky old man talking about how it was when I was young, <laughs> but, but uh, I I had a fair. I mean, I had fairly uh, fairly good sort of education when it came to critical thinking because I had to write a lot, and I was and when I wrote, I was criticized by. Uh, I mean, that I had very good teachers say, "Well, how can you say that? Prove that. Why? Where do you say this? You can't just simply assert it." Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, the problem is in this era of social media, we don't really think critically. We just sort of just let it come in. I mean, laziness, I think, is one of the big problems. Unless, I mean, one of the things that uh, I mean. You learn things when you have to deal with them actively. I mean, even today when I write, I mean, I'm cri very critical of what I write, saying, well, how can I prove that? I say this, you know, and, but is that, can I defend that? And I uh, have to prove, uh, I have to, and I provide examples. Uh, I find uh, when it comes to the social media world uh, that people seem to live in, it's, it's not so much a matter of... Um, mm, Thinking, well, is that true? Is that provable? No, you just simply assert something. Say, this is the case. And then someone, or you read it and you go, oh, okay, without really thinking about it. You know, the, um, you know, when I look at some of the more bizarre things on social media, I mean, 
ranging from what we here call uhu, but it's kind of all this, you know, uh, you know, crystals and vibes, and um, I don't know what else you call it. This kind of you talk about astrology metaphysics? and metaphysics? all that stuff. Mm. That uh, that's that. I mean, there's which can become quite dangerous when you look at kind of the response. I mean, when when people during the COVID crisis who knew nothing about medicine would then start offering all kinds of solutions. I mean, it got even worse when the president of the United States started promoting kinds of these bizarre remedies, you know, ivermectin or uh, drinking chl chlorine. I mean, all of these things were pretty, um, pretty, uh, pretty bizarre. And the thing is that people with no critical thinking, uh, they said, okay, well, uh, Donald Trump said so, so it must be true. Uh, and then you see all the people in Russia today who are, I mean, you have, so, you know, listening to Solovyov and Skabayev, uh, you know, saying ridiculous things. And people just sit there, watch TV and just sort of like, you know, oh, okay. Uh, so the absence of critical thinking, I think, is a serious problem. But it's, uh, but it's not simply a matter of, I mean, the problem is that critical thinking requires mental work. And that's why I said, if you're lazy, you don't do the mental work and you just sort of say, oh, OK, well, that's that's what they say. This is the case. And so it must be the case. Um, so I don't know what I mean, critical thinking ultimately go back to your question. How do you teach critical thinking? Well, you have to be critical of what people say and you learn that you have to be that, you know, that I can't simply make a claim without being able to prove it. So. Otherwise, critical thinking becomes just a, a slogan that you use, but critical thinking, in fact, requires hard work. Uh, I agree, absolutely. The thing is, what I have noticed, I work as a, as a trainer uh, for uh, mindfulness, for emotional intelligence, communication, and what I noticed that when at school, when you were younger, when you uh, have some kind of learning process of some skill, it kind of stays with you, and the mental um, effort when you are later in, a, in your adult life, it comes, uh, it comes more naturally. So if it's kind of you are 35 and suddenly you will start to learn critical thinking, it's, it, it takes a lot of mental effort, kind of that. So the question yeah, is well, that, it can be, yeah. it, it can be, I mean, the thing is you need it at an early age and you can train it later on. I mean, I found this more in a, sort of strictly with muscles that I had a shoulder operation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they took apart the muscles and then they put a new thing, I mean, a new joint, and then they put the muscles back. The problem was that I'd lost my muscle memory. So when I swim, I mean, I've been swimming my entire life and I swim rather well. So when I do the crawl, this I do all this naturally. And this and with my, this arm, I was like, went over there, went over there. Wow. And I had to think about it. So, mm. I mean, because the muscle memories that you don't, I don't, I mean, when I crawl, do the crawl and I do the, you know, my left arm does a stroke, I don't think about where am I putting my hand or arm. Uh, but then what I did was I just forced, I mean, I would, sw I would swim and I'd swim and I would say, okay, now put your arm in the right place. And then it came back slowly. I mean, you know, after a couple of weeks, uh, now I'm back to swimming. Uh, I mean, my muscle memory has returned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It took many years to create that muscle memory of training swimming that you get, you do it right. Uh, and then I lost that in one arm. And But then with work, if you concentrate, you get it back. And now I don't think about putting my, my arm in the right place because my muscle said, oh, yeah, I remember that. So I would say that basically I think we all need a refresher course in critical thinking through the years and uh, be able to come back to that. I mean, that's why I find writing is very useful because you – you are forced to look at your own words and you say, well, actually, that's really stupid what you just wrote there. And you have to, uh, and how can I prove, I mean, if I want to prove something, I can't simply just say, you know, this is true. Well, I mean, why, why do you say it's true? What is the proof of it being true? You need to have give evidence. And that's how I write.
Mm-hmm. By the way, this is a good example about your muscle memory because uh, there were these studies that when, for example, at school you have been physically active, uh, so this stays for you with you uh, for your next next 50, 70 years. So the question is, again, what we are uh, putting in uh, into kids, right? What are the basic, uh, uh, I don't know, skills? Maybe this is the topic. Uh, what skills should we need to um, put more, give more uh, at a tender age uh, for teenagers? What do you think? Well, critic, do- I mean, being critical. I mean, you need to actually have teachers say, this is crap. What you just wrote here, you know, don't be sensitive. Oh, it's very mm. nice. I'm going to stifle mm. your creativity. When the, when someone writes something that is not, you don't support, you, if you cannot support your claims, then you say, well, this is crap. Please support your claims. I mean, if you say that, you know, prove it to me. I mean, that's, that's what I think. I mean, that's, um, I mean, being sub- subjected to criticism is useful because then you, you, um, and then self-preservation drives you to say, okay, uh, instead of saying something without proving it and being, having people criticize me, I better sort of work it out so that I can immediately provide proof of what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Actually, you said that uh, at school you had these teachers, uh, and you 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 grew up in New Jersey, right? And that was public school or private school? Uh, because public, but public, public, public school. Yeah. So, my my guess is you kind of were lucky with good teachers, or that was uh, that specific school was, was something a little bit different. No, it was an average sort of small town school. Uh, I guess I was lucky with good teachers. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the. Uh, in fact, I mean, it is, I had some really creative teachers. I mean, Estonia's digitization is uh, exists thanks to my tenth grade math teacher. Wow! Because in tenth grade, this is 1971, and she said, and she was doing her PhD in math education, and she said, "I ha- I want to do this. I want to see if I can teach." kids to program or to code 71 wow okay and then she uh rented a teletype machine with a perfo tape connect i mean we're writing programs and then a big telephone modem and you stick a telephone into it and it was connected to a mainframe computer 50 kilometers away and i learned to program and later on, when I went to the university, I, I found a job doing uh, working in a lab, pr- programming a computer. I mean, and when I had that job, it was a, it was called it was a computer. It was a PDP eight. And the reason it was called a PDP eight, then it was about I mean, it was like a, a meter long and eighty centimeters deep and. 30 kilometer, um, 30 centimeters high. The reason it's called a PDP is that it had 8K of memory, which is the size of an empty email today. So you had to program in in assembler language, which is it's just it's a hexadecimal, six base 16. So all the commands are either, I mean, a combination of letters and numbers of zero through nine and a b c d e f g so i learned that i've never used it since but after that i never worried about tech now 25 years after that 22 years after that anyway 1993 i was um yeah we were all in a mess in 1993 very poor backwards all these problems we had um 19, uh, I mean, 1938, Latvia was richer than Estonia, and Estonia in GDP per capita was richer than Finland. In 1992, the first year of a full year of, I mean, in 1938, because it was the last full year before the war, in 1992, the first full year of independence, the GDP per capita of Estonia was $2,800. The GDP per capita of Finland was 24,000 US dollars. So they were eight times richer than we were. 
Now we're in bad shape. And I said, well, how are we ever going to catch up? We're not gonna, I mean, it's like, it's Zeno's paradox with, you know, Achilles rat running after the tortoise. I mean, even if a country grows just a little bit and we grow a lot, we still won't catch up. So, you know, yeah. And then uh, the other thing that happened was um, 1993, the first web browser ever came out. It was called Mosaic. You had to go buy it. You Now we download these browsers, but then you had to go to a store, uh, $29.95 at, a, at Radio Shack, a store, and you got seven floppy disks, and you had to upload the floppy disks, and then you had a web browser. And I, look, and I did that, of course, because I'd always been kind of geeky after high school. And I looked at this, I said, wow, this is amazing. Not because the web is amazing, but it's amazing also because this is the one place where we can, we're all starting out on a level playing field. That is, US, Japan, Estonia, we're all there in the beginning of something. And I did, my gut said, this is going to be big. And so my first conclusion was we have to go digital. Estonia has to go digital. We can start in, we won't be, I mean, we're behind in hospitals, roads, telephones, everything we're way behind. But this is the one place where we, we're, we're starting off at you know, the ground floor. And then the next question is, how do you do this? And I said, well, the way to really do it is you start with the kids. So what we do, so my proposal in 1994-95 was to um, put computers in every school in Estonia and connect all of the schools. I mean, it was not an easy thing to do, but unfortunately for a short time, Estonia had a minister of education who also had a PhD in astrophysics. So he said, oh, that's a good idea. And so, I mean, I was not in, I was a diplomat. I was not a government, but he was the minister. And he said, well, we have this idea. Let's put computers in all the schools. The government said, okay. And that's how by 19, well, it started in 1996 as an official government program. And by 1998, all Estonian schools were online. And how that affected the future was that in, 19, in 2015, 2016, when I was ending my term, I would visit startups. I visit, we have a lot of startups and I would go visit them and I would ask people. So, and these were all men and women, like late 20s, early 30s. So I'd say, how did you get involved in doing a tech startup? And I'd say almost every single one of them said, Oh, I was a kid in your program when I was 15. So the point of all of that is that you have to think ahead. It takes time to change things. But if I hadn't had that teacher in 1971 who had this crazy idea, at that time, a completely crazy idea, um, I would not have had my crazy idea. I mean, I have to admit, a lot of people thought it was a very crazy idea. I mean, what are you doing? You're going to destroy the great Estonian language. People won't be learning Estonian. We're all going to be saying, they had, I, had all, I mean, for an entire year after I proposed this, uh, our teachers, teachers union weekly newspaper, I mean, every week, it was, you know, sort of like crappy Soviet style newspaper. It's like, you know. But uh, every week, there would be at least one article saying how stupid I was and how I was going to destroy the national culture by destroying the language and destroying education. So every week, I'd say, what do they say this week? And after a while, it died down. But the point is that it was not popular, but the kids loved it. And then the kids get older, and then they're adults, and then they're they're all richer than I am. <laughs> So, by the way, congratulations, you now have 10th uh, unicorn as yeah. one of the side effects, right? One of the wonderful side effects of that. Well, mo mo I mean, all of those kids, I mean, all the people who are doing it started out originally in this program mm. in the, the mid-1990s.
Actually, Almost uh, all. Not yeah. every single one, but most of them. But by the way, what's, what's the name of teacher, of your teacher uh, in New Jersey? Well, we called her Mrs. Cummings. I don't know. She's Christine Cummings. I mean, she's, she's in her late 80s now. She's okay. still alive. Uh, and imagine, so for example, you, t you helped to train these digital muscles, right, for those kids. And those muscles just kind of got stronger and what, what came out of that, right? So I, I just can, can imagine if we could just uh, add to this uh, educational process, this critical thinking and all these life skills that we need, communication, for example, and all that stuff, what could be possibly um, achievable? Because this is such an inspirational story, uh, Mr. Elvis. This is such an inspirational uh, story. Uh, by the way... Uh, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> well, the other thing you have to do, I would argue, is be... Is, is, uh, I mean, where thinking is important. I mean, the other case of where... Uh, which led me to all kinds of problems with um, <laughs> Latvians and Lithuanians. Why was, so? Was, no, I'll tell you, it's not tech. It's uh, It has to do with uh, our foreign policy, which was um, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in the mid-90s. All they cared about was NATO. NATO, NATO, NATO. This was all three countries, NATO, NATO, NATO. EU, who cares? That's some kind of stupid economic thing. And um, But I read a lot. And I kept, and then I also was a diplomat, so I talked to people, and um, and I concluded from talking to people and reading what uh, various things was that Estonia would never get into NATO until we got into the European Union, because um, Germany, France, Italy, the UK would all veto our accession to NATO, saying, no, 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 we can't take them. Russia would be angry. And I said, well, the only way that they cannot veto us is if we get into the European Union, because you, you can't veto a fellow EU member state, because then, I mean, if you get into the EU, then, I mean, you are in there and you can always screw them, right? I mean, mm. back. Mm -hmm. They're not going to veto your accession. They have to accept it. Uh, they have to accept you're going into NATO if you're in the EU. Well, the logical conclusion of that is then, well, then we should put our efforts into the European Union. Obviously, we have to do what we need for NATO, but it is not going to work. If we just say NATO, 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 and the EU, well, we'll do that later. That, which was the thinking in all three Baltic countries. So then I was appointed foreign minister. And so I changed that. I said, now we're going to focus on joining the European Union. And Latvia and Lithuania said, they're crazy. What are those Estonians doing? What are they, nuts? I mean, what matters is NATO. And um, so Latvia and Lithuania didn't really put that much effort into the European uh, Union. They, you know, they did, you know, little steps, kind of like, okay, you do this, do that. But we, uh, but, you know, I changed our entire foreign policy. I said, okay, we don't have embassies in all these countries. I sent out one-man embassies. I put huge effort into making sure that all of our statistics was up, were updated. So we had this you know, massive amount of statistics that we handed to the EU that other countries didn't bother. And that led in 1997 to Estonia being invited to begin negotiations and Latvia and Lithuania were not, which led Latvia and Lithuania to be very angry. They're very angry. I mean, the, it was like, why them? Why these Estonians? I mean, there was one Latvian diplomat. I won't mention him, his name, because he's still a Latvian diplomat who said, oh, Estonia is just an um, it's a old whore with uh, lots of makeup. You know, it's like, <laughs> wow, wow. This is all ancient history for you. But anyway, this is what ha and the thing is, <laughs> you have to be able to go against the common thinking. I'm not not so much the Baltic thinking. I mean, it's like you're a foreign minister for Estonia, you do what's right for Estonia. But certainly I had you had to go against what was the common thinking in in the country itself, which was that the EU, it's some kind of economic thing. All that matters, given our history, is joining NATO. But we would not have gotten into NATO if we had not been in the European Union. Mm. 
strategic planning yeah by the way uh mr lovis i i just want to again uh, just maybe con- concluding this this topic of uh, critical thinking but just pops out right now and uh, following again your twitter feed and all the information you share that uh, um, I know a lot of people who are on that side of metaphysics, uh, who believe astrology, who are uh, and all, all that stuff. I know a lot of people who were not not getting vaccinated. Uh, I was vaccinated and uh, all that stuff. And we had these um, like uh, larger than life uh, discussions about these topics and all that stuff. And what I understand uh, that um, my feeling is we need to take care of uh, all spectrum of society. Because, for example, all those guys who believe astrology and uh, me myself, I have, have had interest in that. They too need this critical thinking because they are good-hearted. Just the question about how they work with information, with informational flow, it's kind of not in the place. So my feeling again, uh, this story of yours about this digitalization and that, uh, how much you got this help from your teacher, Mr. Cum- Mrs. Cummins, right, uh, from New Jersey, that uh, f- for all those kids, for the next crisis, what we will have in Europe and the whole world, this work with information uh, and critical thinking, such a, such a huge, huge topic, uh, because actually the only uh, one who does harm to ourselves is humans themselves, right? We are doing ourselves these harm stuffs and uh, something like that. Okay, uh, Mr. Elvis, maybe we can switch about a uh, topic about um, uh, what state uh, Europe right now is regarding the uh, Ukraine. So, for example, uh, Germany uh, is kind of really, kind of really, really uh, tough topic. And again, my 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 thinking goes towards uh, critical thinking, actually, right? Because conformity is one topic. What you mentioned. What is happening with society, for example, in Europe and Western Europe, especially? Because uh, England is, is more kind of radical, so to speak, right? Uh, kind of more straightforward. United States, without a question. But what happens with the, with the old, so to speak, old Europe, Western Europe? Well, I think there are many factors. There's not no single one. Uh, certainly, there is this... Um, well, I mean, Germany itself has always had an odd relationship with Russia, which is that it's kind of like, well, we have the what I call the Zwischenländer, the countries in between. that are always a problem, right? They were a problem for uh, uh, in World War One. They were a problem in World War Two. I mean, we're big. We're Germany. They're big. They're Russia. Why do we have to deal with all these little little things here, right? Um, us, namely. So we're always a pain in the ass, and this was this came up with coal as well. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I was yelled at in 1990 by someone from the Bundesnachrichtendienst or the Ger- German Foreign Intelligence when I was working at Radio Free Europe to stop this stupid independence thing you Estonians are doing. And I go, man. And clearly, uh, Kohl was not interested in our independence or... Counselor, uh, Counselor of Germany at that time, yeah, right? That yeah, was yeah. Kohl. Yeah. Uh, clearly, Gerhard Schroeder didn't care at all because, I mean, all he wanted was his pipeline. I mean, and one of these silly people in between. Uh, and Germany to this day is, I mean, it really... I mean, look at what they're doing. They, ha- they say, you know, niemals wieder, never again. Uh, except when it's someone else. I mean, you know, when it's like, uh, is fine if we're talking about Germany, but, but if it comes to, uh, allowing Russia to destroy the, uh, the post-World War II order that you cannot invade, change borders through invading countries, but it's someone else. So let's give the Russians what they want. Let's not let's let's not have the Ukrainians win because that would be bad for us. Even though I mean, let's not let's not accept that the Ukrainians should get their territory, all of it back. I mean that uh, you saw that with Macron as well. And we cannot humiliate Putin. Well, humiliation of Putin is getting the territory back that has been invaded. And they say this without really thinking about the fact that. World, you know, the the fundamental decision after World War II was that it is illegal to change borders through force, but they forget that. They forget that their borders were changed by force, 
but so um but this is unique right mr elvis this is this is so so uh, uh unthinkable so how the state head of state can forget about something like that this is some, something so so little interest you i mean you want to get energy you want to get gas or whatever what? i mean it's motivation you know, principles right, yeah, yeah. if you're not i mean if you don't think about those things then principles become irrelevant i mean this is um and we of course in this part of the world that's what we have to rely on principles this i mean you know the um i mean the the reason why uh, we got to this was because of what germany did with czechoslovakia right in uh, 1938 and what germany did invading poland and the rest of us later on and what russia did um but people say well that was 80 years ago that was so long ago well i mean the principle to my mind remains you cannot change borders through force um but if if cheap gas is important to you go well well maybe we can change a little bit <laughs> conformity again by the way right in a, well in a sense, no yeah. that's just crude self-interest i think crude self-interest i mean principles matter as long as they affect you but if it affects others then you go well eh, you know they're just ukrainians you know it's, it's kind of homeostasis for your own safety and comf comfort in a, yeah. in a sense yeah okay well i think there is in the case of western europe uh, a kind of arrogance uh, and a sense of superiority toward east europe you know there are those kind of poor lesser people i mean we we've had lots of problems with finland in this regard um i mean i don't it hasn't really hit the latvian press but for years and years the finns kept saying things that would be completely unacceptable in in uh in sort of normal discourse you know kind of like finnish fin and when estonia supported uh, georgia very in a big way in 2008 the finnish president said oh and then she was asked why doesn't finland support them? we go oh those estonians they're suffering from post-soviet uh, oh. traumatic stress mm -hmm. well i mean if i ever said as president oh that entire people has a psychological problem i mean that would be a huge scandal well um no and uh, the prime minister of finland said uh Estonia that's not even a real country I mean these are things that were said right I mean about us um so I mean that was I mean you can find examples for every country in Eastern Europe um um when I when some bicycles my when my bicycle was stolen in Munich in 1990 91 um which was after Poland had become free again and I told the uh, housemeister in the apartment house that my apartment had been stolen. And she said to me, uh, heute gestohlen, morgen in Poland, which is stolen today, tomorrow in Poland. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that kind of attitude toward East Europeans uh, is still remains there. And I sometimes see it. I mean, I still see it, you know, kind of like, who are these East Europeans, you know? Which is why it is very much in our interest to be as good and as as wealthy and as successful as possible. Because you will be taken seriously if you're successful, and you're not taken seriously if you're not successful. Yeah, this is um, uh, additional topic about regarding this conformity. That uh, do you agree this concept that uh, there are those cycles that, for example, when there are tough times, it brings out of tribe uh, good leaders. And when the clock hits opposite side, uh, when the times got uh, comfortable, then the leaders becomes really, become really weak and weak and weaker. So are we in this cycle uh, somehow? Well, I don't know if it's a, well, it's a pattern. I don't know if it's a cycle, but certainly um, you can see that uh, when you have a genuine crisis, mm, if you're fortunate enough to have good leaders, then you will come out of it well. And if you don't have good leaders, then you're in trouble. I mean, I think Ukraine's a perfect example of, a, of like you. I mean, actually, Zelensky was like, eh, okay. I mean, 
he's not bad, not great, but he's not bad. And then came the war and it turned out he was a genuine leader. Um, whereas you see in other countries that don't have as crises as bad as that, but certainly I would say, uh, I mean, we do, I mean, we have a crisis, cr several crises right now, and uh, we don't really see many people sort of in Europe, especially Western Europe, coming to terms with their genuine, with the nature of the crisis. Mm, I would say that my own prime minister is someone who has actually been really excellent with the crisis, uh, becoming against all odds, a genuine leader in Eastern Europe, uh, because she's willing to take steps and say things that other people aren't. Um, so not everyone is, um, I mean, you end up getting leaders that are often unexpected. Absolutely agree. Absolutely. And uh, actually, uh, I could say that uh, from Latvian point of view that uh, I have really uh, kind of not healthy envy regarding uh, Estonia in terms of leadership, what presidents you have had, what prime ministers you have had, because we have had in Latvia a lot of more old guard guys all around, all around the place. And uh, maybe you could, uh, maybe you see some reasoning why is that, why is this different in terms of leadership uh, in uh, our two countries? Well, I don't want to comment on Latvian internal affairs. You have an election tomorrow, so you, you can change it, right? <laughs> okay, um, help us. <laughs> no, just what, what's your observation, uh, Mr. Elvis? Uh, Elvis, oh, sorry. Uh, what's your observation? Because there are some kind of uh, principles in place. Maybe the, the, the question, question is about uh, 1990s, that the early stages, how the stage was set, uh, that in Latvia there were a lot, lot more impact from uh, really, really old guard, uh, guys uh, who are like just uh, getting uh, quick, quick bucks in the first years there. And uh, in Estonia, it was like a little bit more, uh, I don't know, honest and transparent. But that was, that is my perception. Well, I think one, I mean, there's, bizarrely enough, I think one of the problems that Latvia had was how you privatize things. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And we opted for the Treuhand model, which was used in East Germany. Um, which is extremely transparent. Basically, it was mm. the quality of what you're offering. Whereas the, I don't, know, I don't know exactly how it was done in Latvia, but in a lot of countries, they were just like, okay, um, we'll sell it to the highest bidder and, um, and we'll, uh, but first we'll give everyone, um, what do you call them? Um, vouchers. Yeah, yeah. And the problem with vouchers is that as soon as you distribute the vouchers, the value goes down. And so those people who have access to cash, lots of cash, will buy up the vouchers at a very low cost. I mean, basically, you know, Deripaska and people like him bought... Billionaire from uh, Russia, right? Deripaska. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, yeah. I mean, he bought, like, he bought like the world's largest nickel plant for like, you know like a small, oh, small percentage of yeah. Yeah, nickel, I mean, yeah. um, of what it was really worth. Because the problem was you, you give vouchers to everybody. And then, of course, the voucher isn't, the value goes down and you can end up buying, you know, vouchers just for a bottle of vodka or something. I mean, it may be, say, it nominally it says it's worth $10,000, but it's actually worth, you know, whatever, 15 cents. Mm. So if you have access to cash, you can buy all of these vouchers. And so what you ended up, that led to the oligarchization of Russia. And to me, it strikes me that Latvia ended up with some oligarchs, which then had their own part, each had their own party. I won't mention names, but you know who they are. You know, who had, you know, a, a railway and who had food and who had an airline and... But you won't mention them. <laughs> that's a nice, not, that is nice way not to, how to, not to mention, <laughs> okay. Oligarchs deciding the yeah. political future of the country. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember this uh, period in which uh, question was, would Latvia go over to the Euro or not? Um, so there were three oligarchs and basically it was like, 
two out of three would vote, right? I don't know how they voted. I mean, which who voted what? But the point is, for which oligarch would the, the euro be a good idea and for which would be a bad idea, as opposed to what's good for the country? You know, it's just like for my business, is the euro good or is the euro bad? Uh, and uh, then the and but since you own a political party, then you can go and you know tell the political party to support the euro, the going over the euro or not support going over the euro. And that I think was a big problem. I mean, it was kind of the it was from the 1990s that came into the two, 2010s. You know, like what was so that's one problem. I would say that. Um, Actually, I, I could just maybe maybe sorry. I, I could add on that that actually uh, I think that we are still dealing with this uh, with the consequences of that still thirty years later uh, from my perspective. Well, the other thing I which I think is something that Latvia needs to do is it really needs to digitize in a big way mm. because I mean for the past I don't know how many years seven eight nine years. I mean, Latvia is a country that has 40% more people than Estonia, right? I mean, and your state budget is smaller than ours. And you have exactly the same tax system as ours. 20% VAT, corporate per personal income tax, 20% across the board. So the identical tax system and you collect less, your state budget is smaller than ours. That, I mean, now what that comes from, to my mind, is that the taxation system is not working. You're just taking in less money. I mean, if you have the same taxation rates, but you have less money, well, then it must be the taxation system isn't working. So, and what made got helped Estonia get out of that is that the taxation system is fully digital. I mean, you just do it. So uh, Latvia, which is, as I mentioned, the population is 40% larger than ours, but Estonia has 1300 people working in the tax administration and Latvia, at least when I looked two years ago, had 5,400. So 40% more people, 400% more people working in the tax authority, which tells me it's not very digitized because you have, I mean, you have four times more people working on collecting yeah, yeah, less taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something is not working. I don't know what it is that's not working. I can't really criticize anyone for doing something badly, but I, for us, the solution has been digitization and it's had a huge effect in corruption reduction. We're now one of the least corrupt countries in Europe because it's so hard to bribe a computer. You can't bribe a computer. So if all these services are, are digital, there's no room for corruption. And so you collect taxes better, you you know, you collect fines and speeding tickets and all those things work because they're all digital. And so I would say that's one thing that Latvia needs to do is digitize. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, uh, just on a small uh, side note, uh, I just thought uh, that um, so I have a startup. Uh, valuation is five million euros. And I was just uh, kind of talking with Estonian investors. By the way, as well, this is kind of really, I thought, oh, when I'm calling, okay, I'm talking with those uh, English guys and I'm talking with uh, Estonians. Yeah. So this is kind of, uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you to your, your uh, New Jersey um, uh, programming teacher. And uh, maybe uh, on the, we, we have talked about uh, almost over, uh, really, really, really wonderful conversation. Just some uh, short questions, uh, Mr. Elvis. Uh, so, for example, uh, what do you think, do you think that people are mostly irrational or rational? Well, they're rational largely, but then sometimes emotions take over. I mean, you end up, I mean, it's not rational for Russia to invade Ukraine. But you have this kind of irrational belief in, you know, like, we're great, we're Russia, we're big. 
instead of looking at the numbers, um, then you you go and do rather irrational things. I mean, this current war, if it goes the way it's going, maybe the end of Russia. Um, what a smart thing to invade Ukraine. Okay. And by the way, uh, Europe's reaction towards Russia is rational or irrational? I would say it's ra- irrational. Absolutely. Well, irrational. I would say, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this all we have to understand the Russians thing is like really absolutely ridiculous. You know, I mean, I mean, they have, you know, I mean, these countries with no experience. Well, I mean, you know, they, I, I, had, I mean, a, a perfect example of this is that, I mean, we talk about Estonian tech. I mean, we have uh, the tech guys are all like, well, you know, you know, what are we talking about the past? You know, it's not such a big thing. And now we're, you know, living in the present and then we want to live in the future. And then Bucha, the news from Bucha came. And so one of our big tech guys, very big tech guys, calls me up and he goes, you know, um, they did what what they did in Bucha, they did to my grandfather. Mm. And it, I mean, it just, it brings back all of this stuff that it's, you know, it's not. Uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, and this is true of all of our countries. I mean, we all have had the same Absolutely. kind yeah. of experience. Yeah. And, and I think that's, so, but that's irrational too, right? I mean, kind of, you know, we're, we're more upset than most people would be because we've had that experience. On the other hand, we look at the people who have not had that experience and then we think that they're irrational because they're not reacting strongly enough. So it's... Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, why I talked uh, so much about critical thinking, uh, because I somehow some years ago, especially when it happened uh, Ukraine on 24th of uh, February, I noticed how I was absolutely uh, with a l- really low level of critical thinking in terms of analyzing all the processes. So, and for example, I'm considering myself to be kind of really strongly pacifistic, but still, if you are pacifistic, you should still analyze information and be realistic about what's happening around. And so I, I start to understand all those people who are like, uh, in Germany, those uh, left-wing guys who are intellectual, who are telling, listen, this or that. So uh, this is the reason why when I find out my own irrationality i understand how actually the society due of lack of critical thinking a lot of us are so hugely irrational and so we are really easy to manipulate with yep (laughs) okay okay one uh, one of last questions uh uh, one of friend of mine asked please uh, ask mr elvis uh, do you have a teachers in your life, what you consider to be as your teachers or influencers? Well, I talked about the one. Okay, of course. Yeah, okay. Maybe others? Well, I think the, I mean, I had uh, I had a really good history teacher as well, who mm. was, he was the hardest teacher in my school, the most demanding and to get a top grade with him really required writing very good things and you know i mean he would just red pen no wrong what do you mean what is this and uh, i had it for two years and by the end of those two years i was writing better papers than um, i would be writing when i went to university so but he was really tough I mean, he was not nice. I mean, he was a nice guy, but he was very, very critical. I'm going to have to go because my guests have arrived. Okay, this is wonderful. Anyways, uh, Mr. Elvis, it was such a pleasure. Thank you uh, for your uh, service to Estonia and service to Baltics and Europe. And uh, I'm really grateful that we have had this opportunity to talk. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful meeting with your guests. Um, when is this going on air? Uh, <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, we will send you a link, okay? Okay. Well, and then let me just say this to everyone. Go vote. Go vote. Go, go vote. Let's do that. If you want to change things, you have to go vote. At least this is one of the important steps. Absolutely. Don't think that, oh, those politicians are all the same. They're not. And Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Elvis. Uh, okay. All the best. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.